Technology, I'm Emily Chang. All this week, Bloomberg Television and Radio have been on the ground from Boston, showcasing the innovation and diversity and power of the regional tech economy. We are joined now by Caroline Hyde at Mass Robotics, live from Boston. Caroline, take it away. Emily, great to see you as ever. And yes, to wrap up our coverage in Boston, we're focusing on the emerging robotics industry in this area. Massachusetts is home to more than 120 robotics companies. The industry is growing and so are its resources. So we're here at Mass Robotics, which opened this co-working facility earlier in the year in Boston's Seaport District. Now, the nonprofit is dedicated to fostering young Boston-based robotics startups and to keeping the talent, well, in town. This autonomous drone belongs to American Robotics, one of a handful of startups based here at Mass Robotics. The name Mass Robotics, it has double meaning. So mass because it's started in Massachusetts, but also it's a critical mass of robotics. The nonprofit started in 2014 and opened its 15,000 square foot facility in February with office space for lease and a lab to help robotic startups get off the ground. Or as co-founder Fadi Saad explains, a startup escalator. So a startup escalator is a new concept and basically incubators and accelerators have been around for some time. This model has been very effective in software business, but when it comes to hardware, there is no organizations there to help hardware or robotics companies take a validated prototype into a finished product. Products in the works include American Robotics drones for commercial agriculture, gear components and 3D printers. And according to director Tom Ryden, that number will grow. Right now we have six companies um, and we have two more companies moving in and we can grow to about 30 companies in this space and then hopefully as we grow within the building we'll be able to house over 100 companies. Founded by leaders in the robotics industry such as iRobotics Colin Angle and Amazon Robotics Ty Brady, startups benefit from mentorship and help with funding. We don't fund ourselves, and, and, but what we do is we work with a lot of the local VCs. We know which ones are investing in robotics. $2 billion in VC funding went to robotics companies last year. That's 50% more than 2015. Nearly $1 billion of that went to companies in California, $143 million to Massachusetts. But the number of Boston companies is growing, and that's attracting sponsors and partners from Massachusetts and outside the state. So larger players like GE and Panasonic, they are looking for investment opportunity or acquisition opportunities, but also technology scouting, where robotics is going, where the innovators are focusing now. This helps them with R&D, new products, all sorts of things. And for mass robotics in the Boston robotics community, the technology is reaching new heights. For more on this operation and the greater outlook for the robotics industry within Boston and beyond, we're joined by Daniela Roos, director of MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab and, of course, Mass Robotics board member. And you were here helping set this place up, Daniela. And first of all, tell us about what the real mission is here. How much more funding and, and thriving a community do you want? So uh, the mission of Mass Robotics is really to convene the student talent, the entrepreneurs, the VCs, and the robotics industry in Massachusetts. And this has been a long dream of ours. In fact, Mass Robotics started as a grassroots effort. Uh, I've known uh, the founders for many years. And uh, finally, our dream has uh, come to fruition. And what we really want, our big dream, uh, is to have Massachusetts not just the place that innovates and invents new robots, but also the place where people use robots. So let's go to the innovation part of that, first of all. And you are there at MIT really pushing forward in where robotics are going to go. Can you tell us what are on the cutting edge of, of developments that you're working on at the moment and where robotics is about to move to? So in a nutshell, at MIT, we are trying to make robots more capable, more collaborative, and we are trying to accelerate the invention and the design and, and fabrication of new robots. And our common dream is a world where robots 
are as common as smartphones and robots truly democratize physical work just like smartphones have democratized computation. Now, it's important to uh, remember that a robot consists of a body and a brain. Mm. And if you want a robot for a new capability, you have to be able to create a body that can deliver on that capability, and then you need the brain to control the body to deliver. And uh, with this in mind, uh, our work at MIT really aims to advance the science of autonomy and we are looking at making more capable and more agile uh, robot bodies. We are trying to get robots to be my, much better at figuring things out uh, in the world, uh, at being more adaptive and intelligent in how they make decisions. Uh, we are trying to get robots to be much more collaborative with each other and with people, and we are trying to automate the creation of robots. But when you talk about collaboration there, how worried and how rightly or wrongly is the community that says that's going to put people out of jobs? You're, you're going to move on too fast, too quickly. Okay, so I get two kinds of uh, reaction from people who uh, hear that I work in robotics. There's the group who is worried about um, when the robots will take over their jobs and uh, jokes about Skynet. And then there's the group that says, how much work can I offload to robots? And so it's important to understand the fears of the first group and uh, provide new perspectives. And our perspective is that um, robots are tools. Uh, they are made by people for the people. And I really believe that in the future, through these tools that we develop to support people, uh, we will be able to create human robot teams that will free people of hard physical work. And so this is a productive efficiency move. What about the ethics involved, though? Because you say there's a brain and there's a body. What about the brain part of the robot and, and the controlling of artificial intelligence and ensuring it doesn't move too quickly? So there are, um, you can think about uh, this question in so many different ways. Many people are worried about the ethics of autonomous driving um, uh, for, um, uh, for avoiding the trolley problem. So the trolley problem says that you have two groups of people and the robot will have to kill one group or the other. Which one should the robot kill? The uh, young people or the older people? But if we get the technology right, we don't have to make the choice uh, because we will be able to provide the robot with information that tells the robot uh, with great accuracy where the people will be at all time. And that will allow the robot to make adjustments to avoid both groups. So if you get the science right, we shouldn't have too many problems. But Daniela, what about, therefore, getting the money right, the funding right, and Massachusetts right? We saw there how much California is raising in VC versus Massachusetts. How do you compare via the rest of the world as well? So there's no question that California is a leader in funding uh, in the space, but there is a lot of activity in Massachusetts as well. And uh, it's very exciting to be part of this ecosystem. Um, so Massachusetts started as being a huge hub for biotech, uh, but in the recent past, it became a hub for robotics uh, companies. And as you said earlier, over 120 robotics companies, including iRobot and all those over 15 million families who have have Roomba robots in their homes have gained some time because they don't have to worry about vacuum cleaning. <laughs> and um, there is Amazon Robotics and uh, all the robots that are helping uh, with the logistics yeah. of the Amazon business are freeing people to focus on bigger picture activities. And so there are other companies like uh, Vecna and um, uh, Boston Dynamics and, yeah. and many, many others. And around these robotics companies, we also have a lot of uh, IT companies like Akamai and IT Software. Um, uh, and all of these companies yeah. are actually providing services uh, that enable our lifestyle today. Daniela, well, you'll keep on pushing it forward with your work at MIT, I'm sure, and here at Mass Robotics. It's been wonderful getting your insight, your expertise, and views of the future of robots and, indeed, whether we inter interact with them as well. Thank you to Daniela Roos. She is, of course, the director of MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Thank you, Caroline. Now, we're keeping watch on tech stories happening beyond Boston, of course. And music streaming service Spotify has taken a step towards going public, hiring banks to help it list on the New York Stock Exchange. Spotify hired Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs Group and Allen & Co. to advise on the process. Now, according to a person familiar with the plan, Spotify is deciding on whether to do a direct listing or a more traditional public offering. 
Now coming up, we continue our special coverage of Boston's tech scene and speak to TripAdvisor CEO on the future for the travel booking giant. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from Mass Robotics headquarters here in Boston's Seaport District. Now, not far from us is the base for another top tech company, it's TripAdvisor. The company touts itself as the world's largest travel site with 390 million monthly visitors, over 500 million reviews and opinions of hotels, restaurants and attractions. Though times are changing for the platform, the company recently announced that it would be well, revamping its website and changing some of the major strategic efforts in bookings. This as traditional competitors in Silicon Valley giant Google try to push into the company's biggest business areas, trip planning and hotel search. So joining us now for more is TripAdvisor co-founder and CEO Stephen Kalfa. Wonderful to have you here in your, near your home base. And first of all, let's focus on Massachusetts. Focus on the talent pool as you see it. How, how much do you find the ecosystem helps build your business, helps bring in the right sort of people? I think it's great being in a Massachusetts-based company, especially in the greater Boston area, because we're able to pull from an astounding set of universities. We have the pull, pull of a major metropolitan city to pull in folks from all over the country, frankly, all over the world. And living in Boston's just a great place to be. So <laughs> it's kind of got a whole lot going for it. I've become a bit of a sucker for the city, I have to say, in the past week or so. The sun <laughs> is shining. Let's talk about where your business is going, because you have some new products that you want to be unveiling, campaigns are aplenty. And how much is that being evolved by technology, by machine learning, by aiming it more and more at your customer? Sure, so it's a, a great leading because we are about to announce, or we have announced about to release, a new website and, and app aimed at much more of the trip planning and booking and price comparison and saving money as well as that full trip experience. So TripAdvisor has always been known for an amazing number of reviews and those insights that help you have a great trip. Now we're turning and saying, that's wonderful, not leaving that behind. How can we save you that much more money on each and every trip that you take? And so we've announced and are releasing the finishing touches on our price comparison engine. Search its hundreds of websites to find the absolute best price that's out there on any hotel, in addition to the attractions and rentals and the other stuff that we cover. So you add that plus the planning and now all the destination content that we have and it's really the best out there, if I might say so, for offering that great trip experience. How will that change and develop your revenue streams? As in at the moment a lot of it's the click advertising that you get in the bulk of your revenue. And will this alter as you because we'd seen of course the online booking tool perhaps initially cannibalized to a certain extent. So what we're really focused on right now is helping the user and as you said we have 390 million uniques every month coming to the site. How do we help them through that journey from the beginning planning part to actually finding that lowest price? Now whether you're actually booking or entering your credit card on TripAdvisor or whether we're saying hey the best price is over there click here and we'll take you there we're relatively agnostic about it. Okay. On the website Go wherever the lowest price is. Come to TripAdvisor because we will show you that lowest price. On the app, if you stored your credit card with us, we'll apply that credit card to any site out there that's working with us, which include all the major hotel chains, all the major online travel agencies, to secure you the lowest price with a simple swipe to finish your booking. So that's awesome convenience on the app. But no matter which device you're using, it's always going to be the best price. How much, though, has the fact is when I want to search for an area, perhaps I'm going to a holiday like in Italy, as I know I am, I don't want to just compare hotel prices. I want to look at what Airbnb, what other ho home and away, what other companies have to offer. Am I, am I ever going to be able to do that via you? Well, you can actually look at over 800,000 rentals on TripAdvisor, just as you're looking at the hotels. Are you talking we with Airbnb those. to perhaps partnership in any way? Would you look at other partnerships for online bookings? 
Well, when you look at what we call alternative accommodations, that house that you want to rent in Italy, it's a beautiful location. We probably already have it on TripAdvisor. It's not in our hotel category, mm -hmm. but we don't just have hotels. We have hotels, we have bed and breakfast, we have resorts, we have vacation rentals, we have apartments in cities, we have that wide range. I can't claim that we have everything available, but we have a really darn good selection at whatever price point you're looking for. Talking of price points, talk about the investor price point. Are we going to see the margins start to accelerate? Are we going to start to see earnings before interest tax and depreciation amortization start to move forward as well? When you look at the space that we're in, it's a trillion dollar plus travel category. We're the leader in terms of, undisputed leader in terms of traffic. We have more people looking for hotels on our platform than anywhere else. Our challenge, our opportunity, is to take the traffic that we have and pull it into that hotel shopping experience. And that's what the redesign app does, that's what uh, all of this price shopping piece does. We're so proud of what we're doing, we're about to go on TV with a really large campaign. So does the margin go up? I, we expect to do that with little to no impact on our margin going forward. So it's investment at the we're moment. We're shifting and we're building the brand of TripAdvisor as the best place to find that And price. what about globally? Because it's interesting looking at your recent numbers that the US is picking up, maybe Europe falling down a little bit. How do you see the global growth story for you? Well, they're all, all actually growing. The US is growing faster than some other markets for us, that's true. And US tends to be the pace car for a lot of what we've done over the years. So again, all the markets are growing. It's just a question of how fast and which ones lead. I see. And so one, one area you're most, therefore, looking at when it comes to competitors, is it who is your number one competitor in your mind's eye? Oh, the number one competitor is going to be Google because everyone starts almost everything they do with Google. But they're just, not just, they're an incredibly powerful search engine that you start with. As folks have learned to shop for goods and services on a site like Amazon, Amazon now has my personal loyalty to that's where I go to shop when I want to buy something that I think of it them is selling. It's a search engine for things. Yeah, for those sorts of things. Now, TripAdvisor has all the opportunity to become your search engine for everything travel, planning, hotels, restaurants, attractions, rentals, flights. We do all that stuff. We wish you well with it, and we wish you well with it here in Massachusetts, Steve. Thank you so much for giving so much for your time. And joining us here at Mass Robotics, that was, of course, the TripAdvisor co-founder and CEO, Steve Kaufer there. Thank you so much. Now coming up, many U.S. manufacturers are investing in robotics instead of human labor to boost productivity. Boston-based Rethink Robotics is working to find a balance with robots working alongside warehouse workers. From Boston, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology. We are live from Mass Robotics, a co-working space and innovation hub for Boston's robotics community. Now, the nonprofit currently has 15 founding sponsors and partners, including GE, Panasonic, and Rethink Robotics. That's the maker of the robot behind, well, me at the moment. We caught up with Rethink Robotics founder Rodney Brooks and asked him about the robot, which is one of the first designed to work safely alongside warehouse workers. <laughs> Our robots have a lot of sensors on them. They have vision and they have force sensing. And so they can operate in environments where people are. Rodney Brooks, founder of Boston-based Rethink Robotics, is changing the way we think about robots in the workplace. Baxter was our first robot. It's two arms, it's large. Sawyer, we learned from Baxter. We made it much smaller. With cameras, sensors, and enough intelligence to learn tasks within an hour, Sawyer is a collaborative robot designed to work safely alongside humans. We've run out of low-cost labor in the world to do our manufacturing. So it has to be through tools that help workers be more productive. At $29,000 a unit, Sawyer helps package products or check quality control. The idea started more than a decade ago. I was in China a lot, getting the manufacturing running for the Roomba. <laughs> 
that's the robotic vacuum made by iRobot, a company he co-founded. And I was starting to see that labor was getting shorter and shorter in 2004, 2005. The old days of infinite supply of labor was starting to change. Rethink Robotics has raised $130 million in funding and is using its latest investment to expand globally. Europe has become a major market for us very quickly, as has uh, China. I think there's incredible potential to grow the cobot market. According to Barclays, the cobot market could grow from just over $100 million in 2015 to $3 billion by 2020. I'm out to make manufacturing more real everywhere. I think manufacturing has been undervalued, especially in Silicon Valley. It's been about the next app, the next social interaction. But uh, we've sort of neglected technology for manufacturing for the last 30 years. That was Rethink Robotics founder Rodney Brooks. Now coming up, we tackle the intersection of tech and sports with DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg, live from Boston. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. A huge cyber attack hit dozens of nations today, holding computer data for ransom at hospitals, telecommunications firms, and other companies. The attack appeared to exploit a vulnerability allegedly identified for use by the U.S. National Security Agency. The attack hit Britain's health service, forcing hospitals to close wards and emergency rooms. Related attacks were reported in Spain, Portugal, and Russia. Two cybersecurity firms said they had identified the malware behind the attack in over 70 countries, although both said the attack has hit Russia the hardest. The White House is keeping mum about whether President Trump recorded his conversations with former FBI Director James Comey. In fact, in a tweet, Mr. Trump suggested such tapes could exist. White House spokesman Sean Spicer was asked about it today in his daily briefing. Did President Trump record his conversations with former FBI Director Comey? I assume you're referring to his tweet. Uh, the tweet. And I, I've talked to the president. The president has nothing further to add on that. Democratic California Congressman Adam Schiff is demanding the White House turn over any recordings to Congress if they do exist. And there's been a breakthrough in trade talks between the U.S. and China. An agreement will allow more exports of U.S. natural gas. Plus, American beef exporters will have greater access to Chinese markets. Speaking to Bloomberg, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross says this is a step toward building a better relationship. We have a lot more issues to deal with with the People's Republic of China. And I believe that the fact that we got these long-standing aggravations out of the way so quickly augurs well for the relationship pattern going forward. It is the first negotiated trade deal for President Trump, who has promised to get tough on China. And Attorney General Jeff Sessions is demanding federal prosecutors pursue the most serious charges against a vast majority of suspects. That is a reversal of Obama-era policies that will likely result in more people going to prison and for much longer terms. The Attorney General called the policy, quote, moral and just. We are seeing an increase in violent crime in our cities, particularly in Baltimore, Chicago, Memphis, and Milwaukee, St. Louis, and many others. The murder rate has surged 10% nationwide, the largest increase in murder since 1968. And we know that drugs and crime go hand in hand. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. And of course, we're continuing our conversation here live from Mass Robotics headquarters in Boston's Seaport District. Now, Boston, besides being a tech hub, of course, is a major city for sports. The city itself has three major teams bearing its name. One company that has combined this love of sports with tech savviness it's got to be DraftKings. The sports tech entertainment platform has emerged as one of the signature Boston tech startups. Recently celebrating its fifth anniversary, the fantasy sports company has signed up, well, more than 7 million customers, almost eight now, and has raised more than around $800 million from investors. Joining us now is DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins. Wonderful to have you in the flesh with me rather than down the line and in your hometown. And I want to ask... Primarily, you've been tried to be wooed West Coast several times, and you're like, no, I'm staying here. Why? We love it here. Well, as you said, it's a great sports town. Uh, it's also really a burgeoning town for technology entrepreneurship. It's amazing to watch over the last few years how many more companies are starting here and how many more companies are staying here. What about the talent pool? Because, of course, you've oh, got tremendous. MIT and Harvard, but are you also internationally driven? Is there worried about immigration, that sort of thing? You know, I think there's an incredible talent pool here. Anything that will keep that thriving and doing well is great for us, and anything that makes that less so, you know, obviously, it would, wouldn't be. But um, I'm not worried about that in Boston. I mean, there's such, you mentioned MIT and Harvard and all the great schools here. Um, and also just an incredible population of international people coming through, students and the like. It's um, That's a real big reason why I think Boston has become uh, a new technology hub and I think will be viewed as that on the East Coast uh, in the very near future. And despite poo-pooing some West Coast woos, you have of course, kept the money rolling in. And, and interestingly, LA Dodgers part owner has recently helped fund the, the latest round of $100 million. Where does that money go? Um, so a lot of that is going to be spent improving and expanding our product both domestically and internationally. Um, we're also going to uh, increase our marketing. We kind of laid low a little bit last year, so um, we're not going to go up anywhere near like where we were at in 2015, but uh, we think there's some room to grow the marketing budget. Uh, so those will be the two primary areas. And on the product side, we're really focused on improving the game offering socially and also for the more casual user by making the games a little bit easier to play and also making it easier to find and play with your friends. Let's talk about the International uh, Expansion Festival because, of course, it's just a month or so that you, we were in beta in Germany. Now it's going live. How is that going and where else in the EU might you be able to jump on, off into because you've got this license from Malta? So Germany has been live along with Malta for a little over a month. Uh, and UK has been live for a little over a year, so really early to say, but we like what we see so far with Germany and Malta, and the UK is doing tremendously well. Uh, after a year, we're very, very pleased with the results. It's growing much faster than the US was at this point in time, and we've invested very little in there. Um, we're still working on improving the product, adding payment methods, localizing it, so um, really I think we're in a, in a position very soon to accelerate investment there, and I expect it to grow. Uh, as far as where we're going next, one nice thing about the Maltese license it will allow us to expand into a lot of other countries in the EU. We're also looking at Australia as a point that we'd like to expand into and we're just starting to look at Asia and Latin America but too early to kind of say what we'll be doing there. And of course all of this continues, money coming in, investment continuing, expansion, while the ongoing discussions continue with FanDuel. You of course agreed to be combining your forces, you're going to be frenemies, not, not haters anymore. How is, how is that going because there's a regulatory process and it's with the FTC in the US? So far, it's been going great. Um, we've been having regular integration strategy meetings. Um, we've also been getting the team introduced to each other and used to working together. And uh, I've been incredibly surprised in a very positive way at how well the team has gelled. Um, sometimes you worry, you know, you, uh, you look at how the two teams are going to come together, you have different cultures, and is that going to work? And what we found was that we were actually a lot more similar uh, hmm. than different, much more so than we thought, which makes sense. We were both technology startups. We were both working in the sports space, very similar similar products, similar types of talent that we were hiring. So not surprising that we have similar cultures. Overall, though, I've been really happy with how it's been going, and I think we're going to be able to put an incredible uh, consumer value proposition out there in the coming years. Any updates as to what the executive team is going to look like or what the name is going to be? We will have some announcements soon. We are still working on all of that. Don't worry. We'll, we'll make sure we first. come to you. <laughs> and what, therefore, about as you continue to evolve your products, you're working together, I'm sure the technology you can help develop, is it machine learning, is it targeting me that much more? You say you wanna make it simpler and easier and more enjoyable to share and use. What is the underlying technology driving all of that? 
Well, it depends on what you're doing, but for the social part, I think what we want to create is a social graph, very similar to what you see in traditional social media, and we can leverage partners like Facebook, like Twitter to do that. Um, it allows us to much more quickly build that, but ultimately we want to understand who's interested in playing with each other, what types of sports they enjoy, who wants to maybe play basketball with this person, but football with that person, and hockey and baseball with this other, and just be able to make that whole experience easier, surface things for people, um, understand what they want to do and anticipate that and make it so that they can do it more easily. And then there's also a gameplay component too, making it so that the actual features themselves are more conducive to playing with your friends and casual users. For example, the ability to better communicate with each other, mm. um, the ability to track how each other are doing in other games that you're playing that you might be interested in following and other types of features like that. Wet the competitive appetite. What, what about when you talk about partnerships with Facebook and Twitter, there has been the concern that of course you're banned in college sports there's this concern perhaps about ages is how do you make sure that you're fit for purpose when you come to a social media behemoth such as Facebook and the like? Well I think I mean they certainly have their own minimum ages too so most of the people using them are adults um, and you know they have the ability to tell who we're targeting to who we're speaking to so whether it's people that may not be of the right age or in geographies that we don't currently service we can very easily target one of the nice things about working with digital companies is that ability is there and then when you take Facebook for example or Twitter um, and you look at all the data they have on their users it's quite easy problem to address your favorite social media pa ch channel that works for you uh, yeah, I don't want to pick a favorite I love them all but does one work better or not? Facebook's great. I mean, it's there's such reach with Facebook that it's hard to beat. Twitter is also phenomenal. I personally use Twitter the most. It's a great communication tool for, for the company beyond just a place to acquire and engage customers. Um, we've recently started focusing a bit more on Instagram, so that's interesting, and I'd like to figure out a way to use Snapchat more. <laughs> That'll be coming knocking, I'm sure. It's I'm great sure. to have you as ever. Thank you for making the time for Thank us. You. DraftKings CEO Jason Robin, who is sticking very much in Massachusetts, it would seem. Now, a story we're watching for you. There's been a dramatic turn in a legal battle involving driverless cars. A judge in San Francisco has asked federal prosecutors to investigate claims made in Waymo's trade secrets theft lawsuit against Uber. U.S. District Judge William Alsup is not saying yet whether a criminal case is warranted. A possible criminal inquiry has hung over the case for weeks now, ever since the lawyer for Anthony Lewandowski, that's the engineer at the center of the dispute, said he could potentially be subject of a criminal investigation. Now, you'll remember that Waymo, which is owned by Alphabet, claims Lewandowski took trade secrets with him when he left to join Uber's self-driving project. And Bloomberg News has learned that Sprint has indeed started preliminary talks to merge with T-Mobile. According to people familiar with the matter, Sprint execs met with the company's largest shareholder, SoftBank, and had informal contact with T-Mobile owner Deutsche Telekom. SoftBank and Deutsche Telekom told investors this week they'd be open to discussions about consolidation. Sprint was interested in acquiring T-Mobile back in 2014, but the deal fell apart on regulatory concerns. Now, coming up, our exclusive conversation with Dell EMC's president, David Goulden, on where he's finding the best tech talent in the world. This is Bloomberg. get me one of them. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from Mass Robotics headquarters in Boston's Seaport District, where they program, their, of course, their own robots to say welcome to Bloomberg. But now, of course, one of the most established tech players in the Massachusetts area was Dell EMC. It's located about 36 miles away in Hopkinton. Dell EMC just wrapped up their annual conference in Las Vegas this week, where CEO Michael Dell spoke about the company's partnerships with Microsoft and Amazon. Now, earlier, I traveled to the company's headquarter, that is in Hopkinton, to speak to President David Goulden. I started by asking him about the conference, as it was the first large event since the two companies merged last September. Take a listen. It was really a coming out party for the new company because if you think about uh, Dell Technologies was, was created last September, so a little less than a year 
now we're into Dell EMC world. I think people were maybe a bit concerned that the merger would be a distraction and it may slow down the pace of innovation. I think what we were able to show is the pace of innovation increased. We had an incredibly powerful set of announcements. Almost our entire portfolio was refreshed. We have a new line of uh, 14G servers um, based upon the latest Intel technology, that's something that comes about every two or three years. So the 14G was perhaps the biggest announcement. Um, on the back of that, we introduced new versions of our hyperconverged systems, uh, VX, VX Rail, VX Rack, uh, based upon the 14G servers. Um, our entire storage portfolio, uh, which is all based upon Flash these days, software defined, uh, new versions of our high end VMAX, new versions of our Extreme IO, new versions of our Isilon scale out system, new versions of Unity, new versions of Compellent, new versions of Scale IO, new versions of ECS. The entire portfolio was uh, refreshed. What about as we move? into the joint venture area that you're talking about. Can you unfold for us a little bit about how that gives you a step ahead, how you're working alongside to offer more things to more people? It's really interesting that in particular, you seem to have always offered something particularly aimed at female entrepreneurs, for example. Is that something that sets you apart? Yes, um, at Dell EMC World, one of the things that we've always done is we've um, uh, had a women in technology uh, bias, and uh, we have uh, created a conference uh, within the conference around that. Um, and now we're extending that to people who are running companies in the tech space as opposed to just our customers. Um, we have uh, a ventures arm inside of uh, Dell EMC, something called Dell Technologies Capital, something that we actually uh, start talking about more publicly this week at Dell e e EMC World. And uh, we're spending about $100 million a year on early stage investments in companies that will be the next generation IT leaders. Uh, so when we're thinking about that, we're looking at companies who are investing in things like uh, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, et cetera. Um, and, actually, and actually, that comes back to the Women in Tech Conference in, in environment because many of those uh, companies do have uh, women founders. Um, and so we can bring that community back together through uh, Dell Technology Ventures as well. Why have a venture arm? Is it about learning the new future of technology and how you can be applicable in that world? Is it getting skin in the game? It's about being, it's being where the puck is heading before it gets there. Uh, obviously, not every one of these companies is going to succeed, uh, but we want to learn what's working, what's not in these areas before they become mainstream. Uh, many of the companies that, um, that on the EMC side were acquired over the years uh, came through our venture arm, where there was an investment made in them in the early stages, and we saw them uh, uh, develop into promising businesses and brought them into the portfolio. Um, so it's really a question of making sure it's another form of R&D. In, 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 in a different way, uh, but working with companies who are actually trying to pioneer in that space. So it's very much staying in front of the industry, understanding where the big trends are become the, before they become mainstream, learning about them, and uh, helping the company as we develop forward. Your event was in Las Vegas. We're set here in Hopkinton on the East Coast. The investments you make, the founders that you now look to, are they the US based, are they international? What do you think? is the space in terms of, of technology talent? Well, first of all, in terms of um, Hopkinton, Boston, it's been a great place to uh, you know, build a company. Uh, uh, the, the Dell EMC part of Dell Technologies is based here. So um, we have roughly a $30 billion revenue business based here out of, um, out of uh, Boston. Uh, we have about 9,000 employees in the, in the greater Boston um, area, so it's been a, it, 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 and it continues to be a great source of, of innovation. The university connections. Um, we have an interesting research center down in Cambridge. That I think you're going to be spending some time later on today. Um, so that's great um, in terms of how we build and scale a technology company. In terms of the investments you asked, we're making in Dell Technologies. Um, they still tend to be U.S. based generally. I'd say 80% of them are still U.S. based. Uh, we do see some interesting uh, activity happening in countries like Israel, where we've made some investments, and we actually have a center of excellence in Her Herzliya. Uh, but basically U.S. based uh, with, with a mix of East Coast and uh, West Coast. It's not all Silicon Valley. There's a lot of innovation happening uh, here and up and down the East Coast as well. And do you think that's here to stay in the United States? Does anything within the current administration, concerns about uh, um, 
talent coming from abroad, does that change the playing field at all? No, I think it's important that um, our markets are very global. Um, and as a company, we operate in 180 different countries around the, uh, the globe. Um, the free movement of uh, material, labor, uh, skills is important um, because we want to be able to attract and work with the best and brightest wherever they are in the globe, but also we want to be able to sell to our customers who are around the globe as well. So um, you know, keeping borders open and having things flow freely, people, goods, labor, I think is important to the economy and to our business. That was my conversation with Dell EMC President David Goulden. Now, Airbnb is taking an unusual approach as it turns its attention to Latin America. The often combative company is striking a friendlier tone with local governments as by offering to collect the, and remit taxes in Mexico City. It hopes to strike similar deals elsewhere in the region. Latin America is now Airbnb's fastest growing market, surpassing Japan. The company has a quarter of a million properties listed in the region, which encompasses Mexico, South America and parts of the Caribbean, including Cuba. Now, much more ahead on Bloomberg Technology. We're also broadcasting on Bloomberg Radio in Boston, 1200 AM and 94.5 FM HD2. And Bloomberg is the official broadcast media partner and co-sponsor of the Boston Pops Fireworks Spectacular on July the 4th. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology from Boston. And all this week, we took an in-depth look at the burgeoning tech economy of the other city on the hill. And speaking with robotics and biotech startups, venture capitalists, and both the mayor of Boston and the governor of Massachusetts. And we discovered, well, Silicon Valley has some serious competition chasing them. Take a listen. Massachusetts went through a very difficult time in the 80s with, with high taxes and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of political decisions that, that really put us, set us back a bit. Uh, and I think what's happening here now is you have a climate, a political climate, where everyone is looking to, continue to, to, to move our economy forward, but yet also be innovative. If this is one thing Republicans and Democrats seem to agree on in Washington, which is that investments in research, investments in discovery and inquiry translate into solutions that become products and become cures. And therapies, and uh, and I, I feel pretty good about that. We'll continue to work with our colleagues in other states and our delegation. But there are a lot of people in D.C. who get why these investments pay off. No city feels health care funding from the government like Boston. The top four NIH-funded hospitals in the country are all in Boston. But this could be a good thing because when the funding dries up, if it does dry up, it means these people who are entrepreneurs and do want to start companies will think about private funding, and we're there to fill that gap. The talent pool is probably the richest in the country here in the, in the Boston, Massachusetts area because of those universities, because of the groundbreaking research, because of the hospital complex and the technology we have here as well. So we have the lead right now. I think we have the crown. And there's no other place on, on earth where you got 500,000 of the smartest kids in the world going to school and graduating every year in the metro Boston area. So Boston is really, really unique in that regard. What a week. And as we wrap up our final day in Boston, I want to get back to Emily Chang, sat in San Francisco. And Emily, what an amazing insights we got throughout the week, but also today into the breakthroughs that may come in the fields of robotics, maybe from this very building, from this robot behind me. Caroline, it has been fascinating to watch all of the stories you've brought us this week. Thank you so much for your in-depth reporting. It's been a refreshing look at all of the incredible innovation happening in Boston and beyond Silicon Valley. And I know you're en route back to London, so safe travels. We will see you from across the pond. <laughs> Over and out. We've also got an exciting week coming up, and on Monday we'll have an exclusive interview with Katrina Lake, Stitch Fix CEO and founder. And later in the week we will be covering Google I.O., talking about all of the developments coming out of the search giants this week with several Google executives. That's all today from San Francisco and Boston. We'll see you on Monday. This is Bloomberg.